Distinguished rabbis, honored shluchim, lay people, balabatim, donors, from around the globe, I welcome you here today to be a part of the Chabad Worldwide Convention. From the top of the brass way down, the entire Chabad movement is honoring rabbis like me that have gone out to the world, and today we're also honoring each and every one of you, the supporters of Chabad of Bel Air. You are the oil, you have a lot to do with the engine of what we do on a daily basis. Today, me, other rabbis, and this entire weekend, we were looking for inspiration. We were looking like, wow, what can I get out of this? What can I do this week when I go back to my place for a whole year, like blood coming to a heart? I want to be re-energized. I want to feel good about what I'm doing. And trust me, for the last couple of days, it was really good. Some of you have spent Shabbos here, and you walked into 770, some of you for the first time, and you saw that L'chad Daidi. And some of you were singing at the Shabbos tables. You were walking down the streets, and you were seeing throngs of people just walking out of their homes. And you were saying, wow, what a community. What a home base. And my dear friends, I know why I'm here. I know why I'm a shliach. You see, I grew up in the hood. I grew up at the Rebbe. I got all of his teachings. There was nothing in my mind other than I want to go out to the world. I want to take the Rebbe's teachings and transform this world with loving and kindness. And many of you today are asking, how did you leave this neighborhood? How did you go out of Crown Heights? This is the place. What are you doing? What are you doing? How do you even survive? And you even ask your rabbi from time to time after visiting this place, how did you do? But we all did leave because we left with the Rebbe's vision to change this world for the better. But you? Today? Thanksgiving weekend? What are you doing here? I don't get it. Do you remember a few years ago, true story, each and every one of you, this is a true story, you all were starting to tell people, uh, you know, there's a Chabad rabbi, and your friend said, don't walk into that Chabad house. It's a cult. They're going to change your life. They're going to start doing things to you, and you're going to regret ever walking into that Chabad house. Just about each and every one of you had this conversation with one of your best friends. <laughs> Talk about changing your life. Well, my dear friends, <laughs> you're here. <laughs> you're here, and guess what? You're loving it. It's like, I'm loving this. And your friend, <laughs> If only your friends could see you now. They would plot. They're going around. Are you kidding me? So the truth of the reality is, what happened? What happened? You're a normal American guy. Today's football. You should be going to the game. You're sitting here. How did it happen that you're all sitting here loving it on such a weekend? And I'm going to tell you your story. Many of you and it's not surprising to us rabbis, are still card-carrying members of conservative and reformed temples. We know it. In fact, some of you are board members on the federation in your area. We know that too. You used to ask, what is Chabad? And now you board members get so, ah, I got a grant for Chabad. How did that happen? How do you go from what is Chabad and now you're working behind the scenes, I want to get more money for Chabad. In fact, you remember the days that you say go and they say, I didn't see you in temple for the high holidays. Where did you go? I oh, went to Chabad. Where? <laughs> you were kind of embarrassed that you were sitting separate from your spouse, separated by an iron curtain, and then you go, <laughs> but today, uh, it's honorable. Where were you? I oh, was at Chabad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You walk around, yeah, I'm a Chabad. Thing. Not only are you so proud, you start to tell your friends, I want you to come in the building. My name's on the wall. That's what happened to me. <laughs> what happened? I'll tell you what happened. You stopped calling him your rabbi. You started telling everybody he's my family. That's what happened. You started calling him my family. Whoa. 
family? Whoa, how did that happen? I can understand you have relationships in business. I can understand you have relationships with spiritual mentors. Family? That's getting kind of personal. My dear friends, I told you I want to tell you your personal story. And I want to go back in time, each and every one of you, and I'm going to talk to you about how you became part of the rabbi's family. A couple of years ago, could have been 10, 5, 10, 20 years ago, a young rabbi, a young couple come out to a vision, with a vision to this beautiful area with absolutely no financial backing, absolutely no building, didn't even have a conditional use permit for their home. And there they were, starting out and just doing what they do best. All this rabbi and his wife had was amazing teachers from an amazing rabbi in New York with a vision to love every single Jew unconditionally. That's all he knew. There was no questions. People didn't get that message, but that was the message that they wanted. And they began reaching out. He called you. He saw you in the supermarket. He met you. After your very first meeting, before you even said goodbye, nice meeting you, you already had a confirmed reservation that you were sitting this Friday night with his family at a beautiful Shabbos dinner. You met his family. You are in love. That family. <clears throat> your wives became friends. Your children became friends. Your rabbi became your lachayim buddy. You were getting close. Confused by the negative press, what's with these Chabad guys? What's this negative press? They want to put up a menorah? Why, why, are, they, why are they giving negative press to my friend slash rabbi? What's going on here? So you started Google searching. And everywhere you look, whoa, this negative press is not in my community. It seems like they have this disease wherever they go. They start up. There's all of a sudden this menorah issue, conditional use permit issues. What's going on? Why are we having all of these issues? Why are they going after my rabbi and his buddies? And we Chabadniks love being in the press, trust me. But bad press, come on. All you see is the true dedication. You see, his wife just pulled out 20 chalas, and she goes with her husband or her children to go to the shopping mall, they go visit homes and say, here's a challah. What are you giving away challah? It's Shabbos tonight. Here's candles. Oh, that's right. It's Friday night. You know, I totally forgot it. All of a sudden, people, there's a Jewish awareness. You're giving me candles? Why are you giving me these candles? Please, just like Shabbos candles. And all of a sudden, the mother gets on the cell phone. She calls up her grandmother. You wouldn't believe it. I met these two people that remind me what you do about candles. And you're watching from a distance. I like. I like my family. You see them turn into their home into something unbelievable. It's not just a home anymore. You see, their home becomes a shul. It's not just a shul, it's an educational center. It's not just an educational center, it's a Sunday Hebrew school. It's not just a Sunday Hebrew school, it's a mommy and me. It's not just a mommy and me, it's a place where you have private counseling whenever you have an issue. They never complained that their home became the highway in the middle of town, going right through their home. Each and every one of these rabbis, the more people that showed up, the more cars that were parked, the more negative press, unconditional love and you're watching you become smitten you ask you search you question you find out you find out this love and dedication is so unconditional that you start to realize something this guy is the real deal I've seen a lot of marketing people and there's an agenda these guys don't have an agenda these guys really want people to feel good about their Jewishness and all of a sudden, it's ringing in the back of your ear mind. Why are my friends telling me, don't go to Chabad? I don't have an answer. Does nothing support their claims? And now you start fantasizing, what a rabbi. I want him to quit his job and work for my company. If I can get him on my salary, I'm telling you, his love, his dedication, his energy, whoa, would my business go up? I'll give him 25% of the company. He'll never have to fundraise for the rest of his life. But he's not joining your company. But he'll take you 25%. <laughs> All of a sudden, 
They used to give people come in, clients come in, you go to ball games. Now who are you going to a ball game? With this guy with a beard. And you find out the guy knows more about the ball game than you do. Your wife goes over and starts baking chalas. Your children become friends, and then the rabbi, all of a sudden, his wife calls up. He says, can my kids go over to your house and play? Sure. And all of a sudden you say, honey, get the Disney tapes away fast. Get them out. The rabbi's kids are coming over. You're loving your new relationship. It's getting deeper. You and your wife start thinking, what would be if, God forbid, there's an emergency? Who around here can we really leave our children with? And then you realize, I don't have anybody better on the top of my list than the rabbi, his wife, and his kids. Who else? Everybody else would seem like it's a nuisance. To them, you know, you don't even have to finish the sentence. There is nobody in my town besides Bubby and Zadie that I would leave my children with. Your friends warned you. You didn't listen. And now you have the most incredible friendship, your most unique friend life with this beautiful family. And this is one of the biggest mysteries that Jewish organizations are trying to figure out. What is it about those Chabad rabbis and families with our biggest donors? What is it about the Chabad family? What is their secret? What's their ingredient that gets them that whenever we're talking at a board meeting, they go and say, you know, my Chabad rabbi, the other, it's like everything is my Chabad rabbi. I want to share with you a few amazing stories how I know that this has gone beyond the pale of their understanding. If this, let me tell you a few stories from Shluchim. I'm not going to say the names, I'm not going to embarrass them. I'm not going to say this city, but these are true stories. It was a lady, a Rebbitzin. You know, sometimes you move from one place to another place. She was nine months pregnant. They were moving from one house to another. So all of a sudden, four women show up. We're going to help you. They unpack and do everything. And one lady was in the kitchen. And she goes and says, oh, look, a dishwasher. I'm so happy you have a dishwasher. One of the women that started taking a kosher class with the rabbit sing goes and says, didn't I hear once that a dishwasher can become unkosher? So I don't really think they have a dishwasher. Is that true? So the Rebbitzin didn't want to get into a squabble between the women. She goes and says, I have a dishwasher. I married him. <laughs> the next day, these four women are standing in the afternoon with a delivery truck from Best Buy with a brand new dishwasher. Who does things like this, if not family? So many of you are doctors, lawyers, dentists, and you give them the family rate. You meet the rabbi, you're a dentist, and you say, come on, and I want to give you a cleaning. You don't charge him. It's a family rate. But being that his wife is busy, you bring Chani, Mendy, and all the kids, and all of a sudden you tell him, sit there, you can read the Highlight magazine. That's the only magazine you can read over here. Okay, fine. And then all of a sudden you say, Chani, hop on the chair. Oh, hygienist, take Mendy. And before you know it, for the next 20 years with joy, you're giving them free service. Why? Their family. The other day I heard a story about a husband and wife. They live in a city for 20 years and they give food like it's going out of style. I'm telling you, you know what it is. Come on, come on. All of a sudden there was a guy that was remodeling his own home. He took out an extra $100,000 for his remodeling of his own home. He walked into the rabbi's house and he goes and says, Rabbi, when people come to your home, it can't be an old home. I love you that much. Here's $100,000. Remodel your entire kitchen. The shliach and his wife now live in a state-of-the-art kitchen. Why? Family. Here's a story that happens many times, and it's so beautiful to know. Everybody knows a Chabad rabbi, when they make a simcha, a bar, a bat mitzvah, whatever it is, they want everybody to enjoy it. They're not going to go out and make a quarter of a million dollar extravaganza, which a lot of people do in the area. They're going to make something nice. They're going to make something pretty. They're going to make something really Hamish. There's a knock on the door about three, four weeks before the simcha. And it happens many times. The guy goes, says, I hear you're having a bar, a bat mitzvah. Come and goes, yeah. He says, I wrote this check out to you. I don't want a tax receipt. This is me giving to you. Let's make a beautiful simcha. He goes out, 
husband and wife open up the check, somewhere between five and ten thousand dollars, tears going down. <sighs> we are going to have a beautiful simcha. This happens so often. Who does things like this? Only family. After you leave the home, you're feeling good to yourself, and you know what? You look up to the heavens and you say, Almighty, thank you for bringing this family into my life. I don't really think I gave them enough, but I love what they do for me, and one day I'm going to do more. You're not a supporter. So you people that's sitting here thinking you're going to hear it many times, you laymen, you donors, you're not a supporter. You're a family. You are there at every bar and bat mitzvah and bris. And many people may think because you're a donor. But in the secret mind, everybody knows they're not a donor. You're family. So in the name of all the shluchim and all the people that are coming from around the world, I want to say for the rabbis that are sitting next to you, they've said it a few times, but I want to say, we really, really love you. We really believe your family. And I am letting you know now, it's not just the big building that we have plans for, but the thank yous could never be enough because you believed in me and you have no idea what that did for me when I was 24, 25 years old. You made me. You supported me. And I love you. So now you wonder, how did we leave Crown Heights? Let me tell you a secret. It was very hard. But with people like you, I'm talking very serious. There's not a Chabad rabbi that is sitting here ever thinking in the back of his head, one day I'm going back to Crown Heights. There is not one person anywhere because when you have family and people like you, and I am so ingrained in your life, there's nobody that is ever thinking, I have to come back here. You wonder, how did we leave? Let me tell you something. There are days that I still go back. I wish I was by a Fabregen. I wish Simchas Torah was there. But then when I see you at my Simchas Torah, whether it's 20 people or 200 people, I'm here because you are my life. From time to time, families have to move away from a Chabad house. And they sit down to the rabbi, and they go and say, Rabbi, I'm being relocated, my wife, my children, whatever it is, we've got to move to another state. I've got to tell you, Rabbi, this is the most difficult decision. And you're thinking, I know, because moving a house. And all of a sudden, they tell you. My wife and I was thinking, it's you. It's the shul. How do we go somewhere else? Now, I know. In my shul, my people love me. And I know if they picked themselves up and went to any other Chabad house, that Chabad house people will love them. But let me tell you something. That first love, that true family feeling from the beginning, it's so hard to move away. We can't leave you and go back to Crown Heights the same way that you can't leave us. So today, Chabad World Headquarters is honoring you but we're honoring our entire family. So that's the answer, my dear friends, to the mysterious question that the Federation and other temples have. What is it about you guys? He said, we don't treat you like a donor. We don't treat you like a supporter. We treat you as you're my brother. And it will never, ever change. Now here you are. You want to know why you're at Thanksgiving weekend here? Because Thanksgiving weekend is a weekend to spend with family. And my dear friends, this is your natural family. And if someone says to you, why did you go? I said, you're kidding? If I'm going to go out of town, trust me, going with my rabbi, we had fun. It's family. In closing, I want to tell you a story. There's this girl, she had a bit of life. Her mother passed away when she was two years old. Her father couldn't take care of her. Put her, the boy, the older brother and the daughter, up for an orphanage, separate places, the girl cried. 
the orphanage couldn't take her. The father took her back in and the boy bo- <coughs> tried getting this girl to go to another family. See, they lived in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. This family in New York, go, take care of my two children. They get off the train, and the family says, oh, in Yiddish, are you so-and-so? He goes, yeah. But the kids looked, huh? The daughter, only the daughter. She was five years old on that train by herself to New York. She didn't understand, oh, you don't understand Yiddish? The aunt was so traumatized that this kid, I can't take care of you, bought a ticket and put the kid right back on a train. To, didn't even take him home for dinner or in a shower. This girl fell unwanted. So the parents all of a sudden went to an adoption agency and found an adoption agency that was able, and they found this beautiful wasp couple that was going to take these two children. They walk in. Now this girl, she had bad vision, Coca-Cola glasses. You can imagine in the 40s what that may have looked like. And all of a sudden this lady, she comes in with her pearls and her, she comes in and says, the boy is handsome, the girl I will not take. The father says, you've got to take them both. She says no, and she walks out. The people who are putting together the adoption run after this woman, start talking to this woman. Please take the girl also. She's got a girl. Don't worry. Meantime, the father goes and says to these two children, from now on, if anybody calls you Jewish, you're not Jewish. When you walk to home, you're going to find out you're going to be wearing a T around your neck, and you're not going to be called Jewish anymore. You're going to be a Christian. So the girl looks up and says, what's Jewish? And the father says, better that you don't know. The, this lady came in and said, I will not take the child. What would have been if she would have taken the child? Those two kids would have grown up Christian and everything. That lady's my mother. When she was 16 years old, she actually bumped into somebody who was Jewish and said, you never were at a Seder? No. Bought her books and says, there's a group of people in Brooklyn you got to meet. Bought whatever books were out there in the 50s that was put out by this fledgling new American group of people called the Lubavitchers. She ate it up. Within two weeks, not only could she read Hebrew, but the religious person that, was, that she met that became her secret friend actually even taught her how to read Rashi. I always ask the question, if she didn't come to Lubavitch, I today would be a Sunday, Sunday morning minister on your TV set. And I always would ask the question, How was I merited that my mother and father came to Crown Heights, married by the Rebbe, that I was born into this beautiful movement when so many Jews could not be? How is it that I'm here? And my mother and my father said, I shan't those things. But I never accepted that answer until I was one day sitting by a Fabrengen. And my, a mentor, one of them, my guys, Yoel Khan, goes over and says, there's a saying from the Rebbe Rashab, one of the great rabbis of Lubavitch, the fifth. He said, many people think, ooh, I love that rabbi, I love his teachings. I'm going to become his chassid, I'm going to become his followers. Well, I'm letting you know that do not think you made your free choice to become his follower. In heaven above, he needs foot soldiers and he finds beautiful souls, and he goes and says, that one's going to be mine. And it hit me. My mother was saved because the Rebbe somewhere was reaching out. I got to bring this person to Lubavitch. I got to tell you something. Each and every one of you that are sitting here are sitting here because the great love that the Rebbe has, and you were attracted to Lubavitch because... The Rebbe needs each and every one of us that are sitting here. We're all family. We're all part of that vision. And that vision is that every Jew will love being Jewish. Every Jew at their level, doesn't mean you're looking like me, 
but you're going to love being Jewish, that that girl will have a Hebrew school, that she doesn't have to wait to 16 years old. My grandfather did not give my kids and my mother, my uncle, a Jewish education, and I asked why not. He said, there was no way to have a Jewish education. There was no rabbi in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Well, my dear friends, I want to know where in America could you drive two to three miles, two to three hours, and not find a Chabad house that you can go and say that that child will grow up without a Jewish education. And how many of those people do not have money? And the rabbi goes and says, come into my Sunday school. Come into my school. I just want to teach you. How many of you have been with your rabbi on a car ride to go visit somebody just to go and give a matzah somewhere because of Jewish awareness? That's why you're here. You're my brother. You're my partner. And the Rebbe even chose each and every one of us. Please help me make this world ready for the ultimate peace on earth with the coming of Mashiach. And that's why you're here. I thank you all. Today you're all going to be going and asking your rabbi, go to the Rebbe, go ask for a blessing. May the Rebbe take your requests for health for your family, and go up to God and may God shower down Hatzlacha for your extended family, your family, good health. Your business should go well. May God bless you. And may God bless this wonderful country, America. Thank you.